First, I'm going to introduce our guests, and then we'll, then we'll jump into the questions. We have Scott Macklin here, joining us from the University of Washington, Michael Staten, who's a partner at Learn Capital, and Chase Jarvis, who's one of the co-founders of Creative Live. Um, I'm first going to ask each of the guests to take two minutes to talk about themselves, their relationship to education, and why this is an issue that you guys care about. So I'm going to start here on the end. Yeah, thanks. It's great to be here on uh, Super Bowl. I get to hang out with super smart people, so I think that's the good trade-off. Nice. Um, currently, I'm uh, helping to direct a master's program of digital media at the University of Washington, and we are rebranding into the Masters of Communication Leadership because we believe that all organizations today need to be in the communication and understand their story and able to tell their story. But previous to that, I spent six years as the CIO of the College of Education, where I tried to hook up informal learning environments with more formal Formal learning environments through social media and technology. Um, I have a father who's a minister and I have a mother who's an assistant dean so I swore I would never work in higher education and I would never work in the church. But I ended up getting degrees in philosophical theology and I've been in higher education for 15 years. So I've just accepted the fact that I'm doomed. <laughs> but hopefully we can do something out of that doomedness. Cool. Um, my name is Michael Staten. Uh, I actually started off as a uh, teacher, a high school teacher. I taught juniors, uh, U.S. history, uh, and immediately I had kind of grown up with the internet, and I was immediately struck by the lack of technology impacting myself as a teacher and my students, and started teaching myself to code, and ended up in Palo Alto and started a company um, on the Facebook platform. Uh, ran that for uh, five years, brought in a CEO, and now have uh, taken a seat at Learn Capital. Uh, where we're really the worldwide leader in uh, early stage investing into education and learning. Uh, and I'm excited to be here today. Cool. Um, thanks to you guys all, and thanks a lot for having me on your panel there, Dale. I'm Chase Jarvis. I am the co-founder of Creative Live, which you guys are all familiar with because you're watching it right now. <laughs> um, and Creative Live was born out of something really, really organic and authentic. Uh, this is in, in many ways how my interest in education sort of proliferated. This is the, the sort of the next iteration. Early on, uh, I was spent my life doing the things that I thought other people wanted me to do. I was bound for medical school, had to quit that. I was in a PhD program in higher education, had to quit that. It took a lot of courage to quit. I think quitting is one of the most underrated things that we can do in our culture. So uh, in quitting those things, I, I was really empowered to pursue my life dream, which was to be an artist and a photographer. And in Pursuing that dream, I looked around and there was no education that wasn't sort of higher traditional education for artists. And I looked high and low and couldn't find it and I vowed that if I was ever in a position to change that, that I would. And um, so I sunk myself head deep into uh, photography and made every mistake you could possibly make in the School of Hard Knocks and came out with a, a really large following that was based over a course of 10 year history of giving information away sort of 10 years before it was cool to do so. And, um, and in that process, I built a, a large social following that I was able to, at some point, get together with my co-founder, Craig. And um, he was a technology guy. We put our forces together and said, hey, what if we brought in really smart people and put them in front of a camera and shared that with the world for free if it would catch on? And I like to say that it's caught on. A few years later here, we've educated millions in, in uh, more than 200 countries. So. That's my attachment to education, and we're just getting started. Uh, so to start off, I wanted to really think about uh, the purpose of education and what it, what it means. Um, one of the challenges that I've continually seen is that no one in education seems to agree uh, uh, about what it's for. Is it there uh, to, to be an economic driver? Is it there to help personal growth? Is it there to make people happy? Is it there to help people mature? Um, and I think one of the challenges is that because no one agrees on what it is, there's no good way to evaluate it systemically. Uh, because if, if we don't agree on what it's going to do, there's no good way to evaluate its performance. So let's start on this end of the panel this time and uh, go backwards. Sure. Well, I, I guess for me, I sort of dislike the word education because it's passive and it's a descriptor of something that's over there. For me, everything's about learning. And I think education is an attempt to put a cultural framework around learning. But learning, uh, as we all know, think of the, th the times where you have learned the most. It's been something where you're super engaged in, it's active, it's even entertaining that the teacher, the instructor, the process that you were going through was re really had you focused and tied to the thing that you were, the information you wanted to, to, uh, to pick up. 
And so education to me has always been something that's really distant. And it's an attempt to, in the most sort of bland way, set something on there and people, for people to come get. And, and I prefer learning because of the, the activeness in there. So I think even the nomenclature starting at the beginning, before we've even gotten into what is it, the nomenclature's broken until we get some words that we can change a little cultural adaptation of what the word learning impose, as opposed to education, that we're sort of handicapped a little bit. We're, we're sort of handcuffed. So I don't know how you guys feel about that, but. Definitely agree. Right? Yeah, I mean, I learn think. Learn capital, right? It's learn capital, learn yes. In the name, right? Yes, uh, I mean, I think we're moving from, from an, ec a, an economic arrangement with education where there are institutions that provide an education to one where we're empowering individuals to learn what they need at any time, right? Uh, and uh, that's certainly one of the tenets that we, that we believe at Learn Capital. Uh, I think I, I've been involved in uh, conversations about higher education and K-12 education for going on 10 years now. And um, very little progress has been made, I think, in part because we don't actually know what we're talking about. Education uh, has been, there's been a coming of age kind of story with education and then an information transfer um, that happens within education that have been bundled into this thing we call school, right? And uh, as a result, everybody expects uh, schools and institutions to be all things to all people. And um, you know, unless you're Stanford or Harvard, you really have a hard time delivering on that promise. And even those institutions have a hard time delivering on the, that promise. Um, so you know, we're very interested in unbundling you know, learning content from performable skills and uh, performable feedback and access to opportunities and personal transformation and personal growth all need to start to fragment and be unbundled and talked about in isolation from each other. Yeah, I like that move nomenclature, even if it's a language game from education to learning. And I think there's some agreement, maybe we can get at the purpose that this idea of learning, this idea of transformation, I think is really key. Now, I wanna still hold that there's some hope that education's a good word, learning is a good word, and schooling can be a good word, but we can't seed learning just to school. And we can't seed schooling just to education. We need to see the role. So for me, just education is that arena where we can help learners enter in and become participatory citizens in the context of where they are. And that, that, that could be through lining up with people who may know more. You might call them experts, although that expert is a problematized word too. But for me, learning, oh, is how do we begin to motivate either explicitly or implicitly the learner to want to go beyond to where they are and for me I think that's the purpose whether it's a formal learning classroom or a classroom where we're engaging in the world it's that motivation to extend beyond our reach. I'm curious uh, as someone who's, who's within a, a, a university what you've seen to the point that, that Michael just mentioned the unbundling of, of systems. And for a long time, universities and schools have had, had a hold on all of, all of the purposes that we associate with going to a school. Um, and I'm curious, what parts uh, of that system you have seen uh, start to move away from the university during your time? Yes, yeah, so we got a couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna paint a little bit of a, my, 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 my children have this phrase, they do this to me when Papa's over sharing. So if anyone's in the audience, just do that, and I know what you mean. But this continuum, of you know, you know, cradle to endowment, if you will, lifelong learning. How, how do we think about all these learning moments where so much of our learning is spent outside of the formal classroom? And what do those people who spend their time in the classroom do to understand how we create learning environments that are relevant outside? And how do we connect those? So I think one, that, that's, that's really key. So for me, how do we create relevant learning? How do we create relational learning? How do we create rigorous learning? And how do we create learning that is rooted in results? In form formative results so I can inform our redesign and then summative results so at the end of the day I can assess that someone's actually achieved things. Is this how so, the University of Washington is thinking no, about no, it? No, no, this is me, this is me. Because I, I want to go to the University of Washington yeah. now. You said some smart yeah, stuff. Yeah, I, I, wanted, I, wanted, I wanted to give you my framing where I'm coming at, where I've seen that continuum of formal, formal education. I mean, I remember you know, being in elementary school. I had a blast in elementary school. By high school, I hated it. Get me out of here, right? The, I'm, I'm, okay, I got a big, I'm smarter than my teachers. 
They're wasting my time, and I just, I don't, I can't do what I want to do. And at university, at an undergraduate level, felt a little bit of that too. Getting into graduate studies, I, I got to find and, and create a path that made sense. So I think the shift, where I find the good stuff, it's for those educators, those teachers, or those folks who also understand it's not teaching to someone, it's teaching with someone. And how do we define ourselves as not accountants of accountability, but stewards of learning. If we approach it as being and stewards we're out. of okay. learning. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, this is, but how yeah. does, the, I wanna know how the, like you are yeah. within, to go back to Dale's yeah. question, you're within the University of Washington in the Masters in Digital Communication program. Yeah. How, it, can you have an effect in there? Because from out here, I look at that, and the folks that are coming out of there and the folks that I talk to that are in there, they're saying, oh, it's kind of broken. I got this, I can, I can flap this wing a little bit, but it's hard yeah. for me to get off the ground. And in truth, that's why Creative Live was born is because we wanted like real skill-based, I'm gonna go out and do this thing. So, I, and of yeah. course, by the way, I'm changed. I'm chained to an average of $27,000 in debt behind me yeah, sure. that's keeping me on the ground. Yeah, so how does the UW think about that and, and how, can, or how are you thriving? Right, so I can, you that? know, UW, second biggest city in the state of Washington, so really big. I can't represent all of UW, although Northwest, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I can talk about the Masters of Communication and Digital Media program. One of the advantages that we have, we're a self-sustaining program. We receive no funds from the state. So our education has to always be relevant, purposeful, and we have to be entrepreneurial. Our students, you know, they, they march with their feet. So one, we have to frame education in a way that's relevant to them. Two, we have a real problem of practice. We'll work with organizations to design a storytelling campaign with the Pacific Science Center, a Twitter campaign for the Woodland Park Zoo. So it's real problems of practice being cool. introduced to our classroom. Three, we bring in folks from agencies, from publication, we bring in the professionals. We're a professional degree program. So in that way, we're a little bit different from a lot of the University of Washington. Do you feel like you don't fit in? I, I, I feel that we are in but not of all the way. <laughs> now, where I think the good stuff happens at the University of Washington, Ashton, you talked about on Friday wanting to learn to program, and you're gonna commit to that, and you were looking for resources. There's a great article that just came out by a professor of MIT called, called Coding as a Liberal Art. Mm -hmm. The practice of coding is the practice of problem solving. The practice of coding is the practice of working in collaboration. Language. It's a wonderful, yeah. so it's not just coding. So I think even in pockets where I have serious criticisms of the university, both from access, from price points, but where it's done well, it's instilling what one might articulate as those liberal arts skills that I think are key, yeah. that I think align very well with the same things you're after. Sure. You just don't see it in, in the dominant yeah. undergrad classes. That leads well into something that, that I think about a lot due to my background as an unschooler. And as I talked about earlier this weekend, I left school when I was 12 and didn't go to middle school or high school. Um, and, and one of the key tenets of unschooling is that you don't, force anyone to learn anything. Um, and I, I think about a lot whether or not there should be liberal arts, whether or not there should be key sets of knowledge that we expect people to learn. Should we teach everyone to read and write? Should we teach everyone math? Should we re require four years of science? Where's the line that we draw about the baseline level of knowledge that we expect people to have? Michael, you want to jump in on that? <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, I, I, I see a lot of innovation happening in the unschooling movement around pedagogy, around self-paced learning, around curriculum design. Uh, and they don't, they're not living within um, the confines of our, our public institutions. So as a, as a result, I definitely look at it as like one pocket, uh, a huge pocket of innovation and a growing pocket of innovation. Um, so I'm very excited about it, but it's not going to work for everybody, at least right now. Um, of course. Because I mean. they don't necessarily have the type of home environment that's going to provide the kind of support structure around, around the child. Um, so that's an, that's an unfortunate limitation. Uh, in terms of compulsory subject matter, um, you know, uh, there's, there's been a lot of research that show that um, basically you can only think within the bounds of your knowledge. Right? And you can only be creative on the platform of your existing knowledge, right? To the point where like if until babies have functional language, they actually can't structure like coherent thoughts and do arithmetic and things like that. And the point being is that um, I think that the, the concept of the liberal arts and kind of stemming out of the University of Chicago is, is that we all need a certain common um, language and understanding and a platform of base level knowledge in order to be able to leap 
into adjacent spaces of creativity, of thought, and of communication. Uh, and we also need that core so that we're able to evaluate each other and create connections with each other so we have certain common understandings and common languages that we can use and really bond with each other. So I actually am kind of pro-liberal arts, though I think the liberal arts definitely needs to kind of wake up. I, ha I have an article called bound. The New yeah. Liberal Arts. Um, but, uh, and, and I think that the way a lot of these core disciplines are taught are totally numbskull ways to teach, you yeah, know, totally. especially science. I mean, science is such a creative <laughs> discipline, and it's taught as, like, you know, memorize the terms on flashcards, right? So, Chase, I'm curious if there's a <laughs> if there's an equivalent to the liberal arts in in the creative industry. Sure, yeah. yeah, this is like I basically wanted to like pull some sort of like talk show <laughs> stuff right there and go ah because I, <laughs> I, I I agree entirely with what you're saying about there needs to be a fundamental basis. But at the at the root of creative life and at the root of what I personally believe, and I, I think I can speak for the other the other um, execs here at Creative Live that that creative is not something that we're trying to draw a box around. Oh, these days they like to paint and draw and take pictures. <laughs> I look at create, creative creativity as a fundamental human mode of existence. Human beings are fundamentally creative, and if anything, we have boxed uh, creativity into a corner. And so when we're, you know, we're naming creative lives, like, oh, it's gonna be, and like, no, 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 no. Creativity is a zeitgeist term that captures the spirit of the world. It's the rise of the right, of the left brain? You know the that, saying yeah. that if you can't remember yeah. which one, then you're right. Yeah, which or is the or creative left side. Or whatever. <laughs> um, but th there, there's a, the rise of the creative class is upon us, I believe, mm -hmm. and I feel like that creativity is the new literacy. Mm -hmm. And so whether or not you're in, you're looking for a, a liberal arts program or whatever, and that's the basis on which Creative Live was found. Is certainly we we want to empower the creative profession, creative professional to learn and grow and expand within their, their sort of wheelhouses. But you'll also notice that we have health and wellness classes, that we have um, business and productivity classes here to sort of make use of those things and put them on a trajectory that makes the skills that you learn actually, actually really effective in a real world, real learning environment. So whether it's um, liberal, liberal or whether it's creative, I feel like creativity draws a box around what the human potential really is. And I'd like us to start thinking as a culture more about that. When I grew up, the word creativity, the word that kid's a creative, yeah, it wasn't yeah, yeah. necessarily like, a, that kid's so creative. It was yeah. like, that kid's like, I uh, don't quite know how to talk about him. He's creative, I guess. And so I want- Teacher might call your yeah. mom and ask. Yeah. Ask her to like, stop asking so many questions. That's one of the reasons I actually, I was very creative as a kid. I was an only child. My parents used to just give me a block of wood and I used to run off for six hours. And when the teacher would say, kid's creative, I was like, well, I, I think I want to be a jock because the jocks are like, oh, Johnny's on the basketball team. <laughs> and so culturally, I sort of want to rewire. That's part of the ethos behind Creative Live. I want to rewire and re-energize that, whether it's liberal arts, whether it's creativity. That is the fundamental like, basis of a human being. Right. I, but before you go Geraldo on us, sure. I mean, I, I, I agree. And again, whether it's liberal arts yeah. <laughs> or, 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 or creativity, now it's like, where does one find those moments to be motivated? Uh, yesterday on the panel, they talked about everyone has a potential to be awesome. We just don't run to enough awesome people. You know, that creativity of how do we open up that awesomeness mm -hmm. of ourselves. And I think the, the, the types of learning that you're providing, someone from where I'm from might call, oh, that's just skills-based. Well, my argument is no, it's not just skills-based. Nothing is just skills-based. You need to learn to dribble before you can shoot. So there's skills involved, but it's skills, it's conceptual understanding, it's competency, Inspiration. it's done in community. Mm -hmm. And then the question that I ask, whether it's in a classroom, whether it's in a playground, whether it's on stage, or whether it's on the web, is always framing the question, whose interests are being served? <laughs> whose interests yeah. are being served through my creativity? Whose interests are being served through this class? I want to know why you laugh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just, I, there, there. Has some, has some strong views on, on incentive structures. Inci yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, you know, I, I built a company that supports uh, higher education and institutions uh, helping to serve students better. And, uh, and I thought for a long time about why the institutions that I worked with weren't making more forward progress on kind of learn innovation for learning, right? right? And why is it that Creative Live and some of these companies that Learn Capital has invested in um, why is it they're making these kind of interesting breakthroughs and 
something like UW, you know, I'm like, I meet amazingly creative people. Um, and uh, people that have their hearts and their minds all in the right places. Um, but I don't often see those institutions making, making those leaps. And, and one of the reasons is the, I, I feel like the incentive structure around the entire system is, is not oriented around the student, frankly. Right? So if, you, if, you, if you're a college president, the way that you are measured and the reason people are going to promote you or give you a salary raise is if you move up what are called the Carnegie rankings or if you move up in US News and World Reports, right? And um, that's really how you end up getting judged, right? And then if you're an administrator, um, typically your, your, your job description is primarily to hold the fort, right? Um, and uh, there are certain metrics around, uh, and, you know, bringing in more students or bringing in and more And not just hold funding. the fort, but perpetuate your own existence, Perpetuate right? your own existence, yeah. Um, and That's the part that makes me want to go Geraldo. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like hearing that and that. that yeah. Well, and, and, and yeah. even the teachers, right? Professors really get promoted on how much they publish and how much other professors think that their thoughts are worth, you know, citing Inks basically, space. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, called the demonstrable unit of merit. And that's what you're critiqued on to incentive. Demonstrable unit of Dumb. merit. Dumb. Yeah, yeah, you got it. I tell that joke at the university, no one gets it yeah. that quick. You know, come on, Funny. here it is. Um, yeah. yeah, and very few universities actually um, incentivize great teaching and great learning, right? And then courses are designed not around students, but around what the professor thinks is a good unit of knowledge that will fit into a unit of time called a semester, right? And so- On the assumption um, that every student will learn at the same right. pace. And that's right. very and, Foucaultian, and, like the, the nature of the institution has to be like this, and it has to be this many blocks, yeah. and that we're in a world now where we don't need that rigid, yeah. right? I, I no. see these schools yeah. building huge buildings, spending hundreds of millions of dollars sure. to build a brick building. Right. right. That can only hold but 800 It has a people. really nice cafeteria with a Mongolian barbecue inside. Yeah, and it's got yes. some rich guy's Climbing name on wall. it who yeah. wanted to have a part and have a little. Yep. Have a but little but again, I think part of that for me, the, the troubles that I have, even though I'm in an institution of learning and I've committed 15 years now, but again, that's because I'm doomed. Um, so, you know, <laughs> forgive me on that. Is that it's seeded whose interests are being served through the answer of being we are accountants of accountability. We give you a degree. You must yeah. do this to get the degree, especially at the undergraduate level. I would say at the graduate level, though, when ideas of discovery really come into play, you yeah, really yeah. get oh, into some action that's so kind of new. I, I, I want to take a step back and think about, we, because we know that all of these things are changing, there are all these alternatives from Creative Live to Udacity and Coursera, all these options for, to, to learn online for free. What do you think it will take? What is the breaking point where universities will have to start making changes because there are more meaningful and less expensive ways to learn outside of the system? They have to start providing experience, physical experience that the online experience can't. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, yeah. And, that, is and the, that is the one thing that universities still have a, right. a monopoly on. But they don't need to make any more buildings. Let's, get, let's yeah. let them know. If you're listening, you stop building stuff on your campus. You can Definitely don't go into debt. Right. Renovate the things that you have, make it interesting, make it more relevant, but stop just expanding for the sake of building more classrooms because they're going to be, those classrooms aren't going to need to be classrooms, they're going to need to be physically interesting, dynamic spaces where people co-learn and that's one of the reasons there's a physical component to you guys actually sitting here. You guys get an experience, you get to go out with, to dinner with Dale or hang out in between breaks and talk at lunch and, and the thinking is that there's both of these things going on here. And how can a university, the way that I look at it, and I think I speak for my homies here at Creative Live, that what we're trying to do is break down these three key barriers. One, geography, right? There's a lot of people who couldn't, you know, they're in foreign countries, couldn't afford to come to US or don't have the desire to, but it's a good place to learn stuff. Access to the best. We want to take the best teachers in the world, the top 1%, people who are actually doers, and give the world access to those people. And then cost. Right? It's yeah. free. So until the university systems <clears throat> can start competing with, with things that break down those barriers like us other learning companies can, they're going to be in trouble. And bring it on. I, yeah, I, I think it's particularly re relevant given that well, a week and a half ago, I think it was uh, the University of Cincinnati and Arkansas and somewhere in Missouri announced that they're going to start giving credit for free for students who take online courses, which really starts breaking that system yeah. down. Right. Mm -hmm. Good for that, well, I'm, I'm a little less scared of that. But yeah. Go ahead. 
So I, I, got the, I got this photo here. This is my 14-year-old son. It was taken at last year's Super Bowl during the Super Bowl party. And this is what 14-year-olds are doing during the greatest transmitted event, some would argue, in the United States. I'm not a huge Super Bowl they're, fan. And they're on their phone, yeah. right? And they're all, yeah. I can't give a description because yeah. I don't think we, we can have yeah, a Yeah, so, yeah. So they're on their phones. Um, they're, t they're, they're, they're looking up what's the difference between an MCL and an ACL tear. They're trying to find out who Madonna is because they didn't know, but she was pretty dope, right? <laughs> so, you know, this is, what the, this is what the youth are doing now, and what are the learning environments that we're creating that's going to attest to moving from transmission mode, which I would relate to the mode of accountants of accountability, to transaction mode, which I would relate to being stewards of learning. I need to own my learning. I should be able to go to Creative Live, take a class. I should be able to go to the University of Washington, take a class. I should be able to volunteer for Peace Corps or the nursing home. And, and that should add up in a way because that credit and accountability, I don't want to say it doesn't matter. I would say the learning matters more, but I should own my learning and we should have an infrastructure that recognizes the gains that I make. I, I, I would like to even see it go one step farther to a place of co-creation where the people yeah. who are, are, are participating and actually creating with the instructor something so that the, the barrier between students and teachers goes away. Yeah. I, I wanted to go back uh, to what Michael said and, and why you're scared of universities issuing credit for free. No, I'm not scared. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, because the way that they're doing it right now is, um, is they're basically saying our really low level courses that we don't even teach really well, especially to the types of students that are coming through our doors, right? It'll be better if we just unload it, right? And we'll give credit for that and, and it'll reduce the price a little bit, but they're still gonna need to come for all the rest of the courses and, and the degree, right? Um, so it's, a, it's like a, the, the lost leader of a College, so do you yeah, get it, 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 it becomes like a loss leader. It's it's a cost reduction mechanism, um, but it 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 fundamentally doesn't change the business model, right? Um, it it doesn't it doesn't transform what a credential means or how you how you get one. It just means that a couple units that are available to you at the beginning, you can just do online and get the credits out of the way. And frankly, that's what community colleges have been for. So. You know, like I'm, I'm more scared for community colleges than I am than I am. I think for the, the biggest thing that, that that changes the game around credentials, and I want all of your opinions on this as well, is that people seem to ignore the fact that we're handing out more and more college degrees every day, and economics of scarcity is pretty simple. And as you hand out more of something, the value of each unit decreases, right? right. Um, which is why why we see people now getting masters and PhDs. Um, but at some point, that becomes a zero-sum game, and you can only you can only get six PhDs, you know, to become a janitor before someone will hire you. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I have to take the limelight here. Uh, so, one thing that's that we've seen is that there's actually like a, a relatively infinite, insatiable economic demand for highly trained, highly educated individuals because the economic activities that they engage in actually create more demand for those particular individuals, right? Um, and we've had a lot of job loss, loss in the middle and lower income layers. We've had a huge spike in the growth of really low wage, low skill jobs, and we have a huge spike in high skill jobs. What the, all the economic forecasts say is we need actually triple the number of people with college degrees. And the, the reason they say that is because everybody's been so confused for so long and they've equated somebody who's educated and capable as somebody with a college degree. Right. And what's happening now because of different awesome organizations like Creative Life is you're starting to see a shift in that equation, right? Of like a college degree equals a high skill, highly skilled, highly creative, highly educated person, right? And, and I, I guess where I'm going with this is that just giving out more credentials like isn't isn't creating uh, credential inflation. I think that's a misnomer. I think it's a it's a logical fallacy. Um, I think um, that um, what it what it means is society's focused on the wrong metric, right? It, right? Which is the number of degrees rather than the number of people who are actually educated and skilled and can participate in the high skilled economy. You, you said a lot of GRE words in that little bit right there. Sorry, uh, can not, you break it down for? No, I'm I'm gonna try and okay. and see if we're talking the same language. Sure. And that is that it doesn't that a, a degree doesn't equal an educated person. Right. right. So we've got this messed up metric. We all right. agree with that. Okay. Right. So we're, good. we're good with that. We're good. One? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so 
how, how, what, what precipitates from that? Do you change the measurement of the degree or do you try and unmeasure? Like if you're uncollaging or unschooling, right. what about the idea of unmeasuring? And that's right now where Creative Lives heart sits is people take care of themselves because human, like there's a human, an, an implicit human desire to follow what it is that you want to do. The reason we don't see success in schools is probably because we're not serving the students in the way they want to be served. And if we create an environment that's certainly much looser, I would say less measurable, mm -hmm. is there an opportunity non-fallacially, without making a fallacy, mm -hmm. how do we actually hold on to the thing that these students need, which is inspiration and learning, how mm -hmm. to create that? So, so let me ask, because we all agreed, higher education degree does not equal learned, smart, competent, right? True. Uh, do we agree that at some form evaluation and assessment is important? Before we not ask which time. I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced that we need to assess people if they've actually created something, right? If you can say, look, that's my photo hanging on the wall. I don't need to take a test to prove that I can take that photo. Right. I've never once, and this is, again, I'm, I think the traditional creative art, I'm, as a photographer and a director, um, I've learned a lot as an entrepreneur, but it's been in the the actual environment of entrepreneurialism that I've learned yeah. about fundraising and about and a handful of other things. But I've never once, never one time, been asked for my degree. In, you know, I've been out of school like three years because I'm 21. What about so your freshman year GPA? <laughs> <laughs> never. Yeah. Never been asked for a grade point average. Never. Ne and and that's not to say that that's not super relevant in other places, but. I'm just like, this is my empirical experience, so. Yeah. Looks like we've got some questions from the internet to go to. We do, there's a lot of great information uh -oh. coming in <laughs> online, a lot of good questions. And first, let me say thank you to both of you for not going Geraldo, because we love our noses. <laughs> Over here, no broken chairs, no broken noses. If you're a We're little not bit done yet. What is that? Yeah, it's still early. Yeah. It's We're still just getting early. started. What is Geraldo? Geraldo? <laughs> I have no idea. Geraldo <laughs> Rivera is kidding is me. Age. Show your age, Dale. Now we'll start a whole other conversation. Dale just said who's Geraldo. Is, I'll go back wow. after the break. We'll, we'll talk wow. about that. But I'm going to okay. keep my, my good looking nose here. But the question I have for you guys, and there are three people on the panel. Uh, all of you guys have college degrees, some, guys, some of you post-secondary education. A question that's coming in is what do you think uh, of motivated unschoolers like Dale who have chosen not to go to college? Do you think uh, he's missing out on the college experience? Chase, you just mentioned that you never been asked for your degree, but through different experiences you've learned as an entrepreneur. So how about just the experience of those four or five years of being a college student on campus? The irony of my personal college experience is it was built largely on the back of uh, aspiring to be a professional soccer player. I, was, I went to college on a soccer scholarship, Division I school. I really went there. I, I went to a school that was in the top 10 Division I in my sport so that I could have the best opportunity to pursue the thing that I was passionate about then and I learned in conjunction now I got a couple degrees I was you know I did a, a course in philosophy that allowed me to get a P, into a PhD program I did a course in pre-med that allowed me to for medical school but what I did is I learned what I liked in that time period and I think that that environment can be reasonable for that because that's what I took out of it I just don't know if it's necessary do you need to go into debt? Do you need to, to live in someone else's dorm? Do you need to be around? Uh, it's possible that that's, that it's, it's, very, it's clearly very good at those things, but is it necessary? And is all the financial strapping and the challenges that it creates worth, the, the, is it a part of the trade-off? So that's my personal experience. What, what about you, Mike? Well, I found after I graduated that there are a lot of keg parties that don't happen on college campuses, <laughs> right? Uh, and... Uh, I, you know, I, th I think that the real defensibility around the undergraduate experience on most of America's campus is um, a, what I call a culture of personal exploration, right? Which is part of this coming of age story that we like to tell ourselves about college. The thing that, uh, th the reason that a culture of personal exploration is necessary to go through is because at some point you have to decide what you're passionate about. You have to decide what's interesting you. You have to decide what you want your unique contribution to the world to be. Uh, somebody like Dale kind of found that calling without going to school. And um, I think that if you know what your calling is and you're the type of person who can go out and seize all the opportunities that are available to you, uh, can communicate, can acquire skills, um, you can certainly survive and thrive without, you know, without going into debt. To debt. But 
the, the, the verdict's out on how do we measure that, how do we f identify those individuals, how do we, you know, how do we look at a, their resume, even though we don't look at resumes, as we found today. Um, but how do we interpret that? Um, I, and I've met lots of people, the Bay Area is this weird little bubble where kind of everybody's willing to throw out assumptions about somebody. And I met lots of people that are not going to college, have dropped out of college, and are doing incredibly well. Um, I've also met lots of people who went to college and would never take that experience back. So, you know, um, unfortunately there is no clear answer on this one. Yeah, yeah I, I, I wouldn't make the assumption that self-discovery, transformation, happens in the context of a university, whether it's a large R1 or a small liberal arts, you need to find that path that's gonna work for you. Your learning may happen on a ship out at sea. It may happen because you're spitting. The smartest person that I know as a teacher bills himself as a high school dropout who teaches high school, Gabriel Todros, right? And he talks about it ain't what you got, it's how you freak it, right? <laughs> so if you're gonna, if it, it, so the university ain't, what's a, ain't what it's about, it's how you freak it, how you use it. So my Italian grandmother would say, NASA, you need to sniff it out. If you think a university is a place you might gain some value because there's a community, a practice you want to spend time with, or a methodology, or a research lab, or a faculty member, go sniff it out. Go spend some time before you make that investment. Don't blindly invest. If your parents are pushing you into the university, you might say, hold up, wait a minute. Let me make sure I'm doing this because I need to do it. It's implicit to me, not just explicit because I'm doing it for you. And, and those are the tough things you need to grapple with. So yeah, I think it's a place where transformation can happen, but it's not the only place. I like grandma's snuff test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think Jordan, a lot I think, of that just has oh. to do with, with, with a sheer amount of time, right? You spend four years, and by the time you're 22, you're probably more mature and have had more life experience than the time you're 18. Let me say one more thing, because I loved when Chase said that the valuable thing for him and what, being courageous to fail, universities, in the best ways that I found in classrooms, and especially the classroom's design, fail often, fail fast, learn from your failures. University actually gives you a space to fail. I wouldn't want to learn how to be a firefighter by apprenticing in a place where I'm failing. I mean, I, I can't <laughs> fail there, right? Surgery, right? Right, right, right. So, you know, it does give you a place to fail, but you learn from that failure, yeah. hopefully. And we're going to go to the... Yeah, we have a quick question here from Jordan to the audience. Um, I would have a question for you, and it would be that in regards to assessment, um, how do you standardize assessment um, for so many different people yeah. with how do you assess creativity, how do you assess... Right, so I, I, when I ask the question, I think assessment and evaluation is important. Not so much summative assessment, not so much standardized assessment. I like differentiated assessment. I like what's known, as, whether it's a GRE word, formative assessment, assessment that informs. You learn this, you've been critiqued a lot by your peers, sure. and there are people that you trust when you give your opinion. Mm -hmm. That's evaluation. Now you're gonna take it in, you're gonna take it up, and you're gonna either use it or disregard it. But you're gonna learn from that conversation. You're gonna learn from that critique. You know, as iron sharpens iron, it gets stronger. So for me, that's where assessment in the classroom, if I'm a teacher, I want, that's where I think where the real value add is. Are we training our teachers to provide the type of formative critique, the type of formative assessments, and are we having everyone in the room learn those skills? So guess what? They can critique and, and nurture each other. That doesn't have to happen in a classroom. But I think, for me, that's the important part of assessment. It's not a standardized test. That may have a role if you are an accountant of accountability. But see, I want to shift to being stewards of learning. That's the shift I want to see happen. I love it. Should we go back to the I would internet? love to go back to the phones, as back Chase to likes phones. to say. <laughs> so this is a question um, for Michael, but it can be addressed by everyone, uh, from Bookworm. There seems to be a misalignment with the skills that universities sometimes teach and what companies are looking for. <laughs> do you see, maybe, <laughs> do you see More. universities and companies working together to create a better curriculum to match the skills that, on demand, that are on demand in the job market? So, yeah, I, so I personally, as an investor, am looking for a type of, of company to come in and help correct this like nonviolent, non-cooperation that's happening <laughs> between companies uh, and, and the university environment. I, I mean, again, I think that um, uh, course, uh, courses as a unit of, of, of learning experience and, and a major um, 
have been designed around the professor's knowledge and not generally around the workplace. There are some exceptions to that, but by and large, that tends to be the case. At least um, in this country. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, there, was, there was a study that came out, uh, McKinsey uh, just published that uh, something like 74% of professors think they're preparing college students for the workforce and like around 40% of corporations and 40% of students actually feel that way. That um, so there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a disconnect, yeah, <laughs> that high. It, obviously, I, I think those are a little misinformed, actually. But, um, and, and it's actually that gap, that skills gap, that is making room for the type of disruption and, and kind of transformation that we're going to see. I think that universities are going to have to get their act together in terms of making sure that students are graduating with those types of skills. It doesn't mean that they have to design all of their academic programs specifically aligned to just succeeding within corporations, because that would be enormously boring, right? Um, but certainly something needs to come along to, to address that. Um, and uh, I, I, that's, that's, I guess, all I have to say about that. I can add, we've just gone through this process of adding uh, a component to our Masters of Digital Media program um, that we're calling Communities and Network and reframing everything under communication leadership. And one of the major parts of that conversation was having innovative summits with leaders in mobile technology, leaders in gaming, leaders in design, to think about what are the skills, competencies, and conceptual understandings you are looking for. Let's look at your job descriptions. How can our curriculum begin to align? And that, that's just one mode of input that we're having as we've redesigned these, these courses. But I think that input is crucial if you're going to create relevant and meaningful learning. Uh, again, I will try and come from a super simple base yeah. angle. This is how we think about it at Creative Live. And I, I think this is how I've thought about my own education for a long time, is you ask the community who they want, what they want to learn, and then you give it to them. Yeah. And the most <laughs> fundamental, I mean, I, again, I don't want to. That's totally novel. In isn't head, it? Isn't it's it? Good. Yeah. That's what I mean. It's so crazy. So what we Asking have done to, to, um, yeah. Yeah. to our, the, the people that participate in Creative Live, the learners, the, the audience, our friends and, and community, what do you want to learn, and who do you want to learn it from? And, and how? Yeah, and in what environment? Mm -hmm. And with a handful of just simple like questions that go out to the community every year, we get a super long list that is very, very, very obviously weighted, like, oh, well, there are these five things that people really want to learn, and then we go talk to the best people in the world and say, we've got a willing audience, are you guys interested in are you interested in coming on Creative Live? And in defense of universities, though, sure. your audience, um, at least the way, uh, the way I think about them now, and it could, could be a total misnomer, sure. right, are, are, are creative uh, professionals and entrepreneurs that are like really interested in kind of figuring out how to uh, become more successful as individuals and get opportunities that are available to them. And they're much more able to articulate what it is that they need to know that's in between them and that next opportunity for sure. them. Uh, whereas like, you know, 17 year olds and 18 year olds are like, they're not, not necessarily they have choosing. <laughs> but they have passion. Make and this is a low energy, low yeah. risk, and low I mean, I mean, And how often have they been asked as 16 or 17, Back what do you, to you want to learn? If someone, what do you want to learn at 12? We, we need to go back. That's why I talk about that continuum. We should be instilling and leaning people in to own their learning from yeah. And that is the, the ethos creative. on yeah. which Creative Live is built, is that you know best what's best for you. Yeah. And if you don't, you'll find out through the rigors of life. Yeah. <laughs> well, Let's check out the yeah. next. Yeah. Yeah. By trying things <laughs> out and yes. failing and trying right. out something else if you don't like that. Right. And, and ideally, this is a low risk, low barrier way, low cost <laughs> way to get ex exposed to some of the best in the world. You can find that. Is that someone you want to be like? Is that yeah. what they do is what you want to wake up and do every day? And the, what, what is the, what's the price of no? It's no. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I, 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 I just want to say thanks for, take for what I said and making it a little bit simpler. What do you want to learn? Yeah, it's um, simple. When we asked that question of the community, it was an interesting response because it wasn't just the skills and aptitudes. We want professionals to come out with a particular attitude to continue to be able to learn and relearn. Things are moving so fast, the disruptions are so um, disruptive, that how do you have an individual who can sort of roll with that? And I, it's that attitude thing. And I think that's something that, uh, and I don't want to say just professional master's degree program can do, but that's how we're gearing ours. Yeah. yeah. So two things that I wanted to add to that. One is that the, the idea that people need to be able to learn, continuously learn, and refine and hone their ability to learn 
is this whole topic of meta learning, which we spent time on yesterday morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, Uncollege, the group that I run, is starting a gap year program this fall. We're des designing an, an entire curriculum specifically around that and asking why, if that is the skill that we want people to learn, do we expect that people are, will, will, will learn that by proxy after studying a certain subject mm -hmm. as opposed to just teaching that directly? Right. The second thing that I wanted to say is that I think we have the opportunity to, to learn from other countries here in connecting industry with education. Um, Germany, for example, has a great system of apprenticeships. Uh, only about 20% of their students who graduate high school actually go into a traditional high school. The other 80% go into uh, uh, apprenticeships that are developed directly in participation with the uh, industry experts so that people have jobs when they, are, when, they, when they finish those. That's why Germany has one of the lowest youth unemployment rates in the world. I, I love it. And I love the idea of, I mean, there's so many resources out there, whether we're, we're talking about the ones that sort of we, um, you know, stand for. But I think that we, we can also, also like your, your book is a fantastic learning resource. You just talked about meta-learning. Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Chef, is not just about cooking. It's about how, learning how to learn. Yeah. Uh, Michael Ellsberg, uh, Education of Millionaires, it's not what you think and it's not too late. There's so many resources out there to get inspired on how to learn and to, what I did uh, when researching sort of artists and finding out the kinds of things that artists did that I really respected, I read about them. And to read about the kinds of people who are doing the things that not, you don't need, necessarily even need to aspire to be them, but to yeah. learn about how they learned about them. It's, it's very often a, a circuitous path that makes you feel better about not being, I'm on this track and I'm going to do this and this and this. I never assisted, for example. Um, I went to, I was in a PhD program, which is really unusual, in philosophy, which didn't have anything to do with art. So, I don't know, I, I feel like those, the ability to learn that the path that you're on is the right path, even if it's confusing, if it's different, yeah. it is, is makes people more comfortable in their own self-directed learning. I, um, I, have a, I have a great uncle, Attilio, and my uncle, Dario. They were tile setters when they came over from Italy. They tiled their way from Ohio to Southern California in the, the you know, 60s. Road? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> our, yeah our, our family claim to flame is they, they, they tiled John Wayne's home. Right? Wow, nice. And when, when I had a film premiere at the Newport Beach Film Festival, Ethan Wayne hosted the, the festival, and I was able to go to his house and go, I have an inn. You see this floor? My uncle did this floor. He goes, that cranky bastard? Yeah, it's my <laughs> uncle, right? But what my uncle said in, in learning tile and going out on the crew with him, it's, it's, it's this notion of see one, do one, teach one. I want you to watch me. Watch me do tile. Now you're going to do one, and I'm going to watch you and give you a critique. Now, the skill is, if I can teach someone else, then he's going to hire me and put you on the crew. So that learning and being able to relearn and the, be able, the ability to share that learning. And I think that's what's key when you just talked about having this global perspective. It's not that I need to go teach someone else in the world. What can I learn from our partners and friends and family in South Africa, Brazil, Peru? They're doing amazing things. And where's that, where's that reciprocity of learning so we can learn um, um, I think in mutually beneficial ways. I think we have some more comments. Yeah, some coming up. I like the internet. I, I know I'm in the right place because Geraldo was referenced, and someone said it ain't what you got, but it's how you freak it. Okay, this is Creative Live <laughs> right <laughs> here. <Creative> Live. <laughs> I love it. Uh, question right here. In, in, in views from Fashion TV, an active a contributor on current uh, Creative Live, Fashion TV says, in view of academia, if we say we are a student or maybe even a graduate of something like a Creative Live. Who or what will give us the validation that we are good enough to do what we claim? A degree holder has a piece of paper from an institution uh, that provides that validation. How do we get that validation otherwise? I think you just gave an interesting example of that. Yeah. I got to go. I, I, yeah. I have to hijack this. Okay. I'm sorry. Hey, you can hijack because my hope for, for this platform as an example is that you are inspired every day by whoever's up on here that they're going to give you just the, the breadcrumbs that like, you're good enough. If you can do this, this, and this, this is when you should be buying this next camera or trying to go out on your own. That it's a part of the actual learning is the inspiration and the validation. Because most of, I've never received outside validation for anything I've done. <laughs> we, like, we had a whole conversation yesterday about the importance of being able to internally assess yeah. and derive that value from Now is the time where I can actually go to this or I can charge this much or it's my time to direct my first film or commercial or whatever. No one is out there going, and... I knight you, you're now a director. Never happens. So right. the idea of someone else doing that for me through any assessment on fashion style TV or whatever the commenter's name was, I haven't personally experienced it. And I was in a PhD program. Not even then, if anything, they gave me this false thing. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I, I was wondering if, uh, if someone gave Michael permission to start his first company. 
<laughs> no, as a matter of fact, my mom for four years, especially my grandma, said that I needed to get a real job. Um, so they encouraged me to be a banker. After you had raised money. After I money. had raised money and was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there was a, even though I found the Silicon Valley environment very encouraging, there's like, you know, uh, it, it's, it's an uphill battle the whole time, for sure. And it, it's, a, it's a solo journey, um, at least at the beginning. Of course, after, after the first couple months, hopefully it's a team sport, but <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, well, I, I was going to circle back. One thing that we, we look at at Learn Capital is really uh, the rise of brands. Um, so Creative Live is building a brand around great production, world's experts. Uh, we, we've invested in General Assembly, which, you know, it took Oxford a thousand years to build a global brand. It took Harvard, uh, you know, 300 years to build a global brand. It took General Assembly about nine months. So um, we think that um, with the ability to communicate with the world at large, you can also communicate the integrity of the, the educational programming you're delivering. Uh, and so as a result, even though maybe right now, you know, somebody that's on the receiving end of your application may not have an association with these new, new emerging brands, it's only a matter of time before they just go, oh, you know, I've seen you take like 10 courses on a creative live, or I've seen you do this, and like that indicates to me that you're getting your information in the right places, and I can trust the education that and you're getting. I think one thing that, that you did really smartly in naming Creative Live is that you, you added the cultural value right there in the name, right? It's about creativity. Mm -hmm. In yeah. the same way, as, as I mentioned earlier, that people who, who go to Wharton are finance people, and like MIT has the hackers, and Harvard has yeah. the crazy a a academics. Yeah. I would, you know, the assumption, and I would like to talk with the person who asked the validation question. For me, the validation is more important in that critique and that assessment and that nurturing of the work, but for me, the work is the validation, whether it's on the wall, yeah. in the print, in your portfolio, and I would argue the folks who are gonna look at some validated degree for hire, I don't wanna work for that person anyway, right? But, and I think you're right, the, 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 the move is changing on what we count as counting. Mm -hmm. So I think it's one, it's, it's about the work. Mm -hmm. You have to do great work. Yes. You have to hustle. Mm -hmm. No one's gonna give you anything. Mm -hmm. So it's about the work and about the hustle. And whether that winds up in a degree or not, that's sort of moot. And that's where the lack of, like, the, yeah. the lack of fulfillment on the promise of traditional education pisses me off. Yeah, yeah. Is there's an understanding that if you're in school or I feel like I can still say this, that, that there's an understanding that if you're in school, especially a good school, uh, that has, a, has a, a brand, a pedigree behind it, that you're going to get a job if you get out. And it's just not true. It's just completely not true. Yeah. And yet our, our youth are investing their money, their parents' money, their time, their precious years of their life to get out and find that they've been misled. The stats are really grim. Yeah. So Twenty-two and a half percent of college grads under twenty-five are unemployed, and another twenty-two percent are working jobs that don't require their degree. So fifty percent of the people, roughly, are hosed. Yep. <laughs> that's not a good. <laughs> and, if we're, and, and that's and if not counting the fifty percent that drop out before funny. they even graduate. Sorry. Yeah. So there's fifty percent that drop out before they graduate. I don't even know what percent is that. I'm lost track. But mm -hmm. it sounds like it smells funny. Yeah. And what, what smells funny about it is this false promise. And what I aspire to create is a world where we don't offer false promises, that we provide an environment that is rich, and people gotta figure it out. Now, I, I can't say, like, there, there's a whole cross-section of the world that we're talking about that still doesn't have access to even these things that we're talking about, regardless of the, the barriers of geography and cost and one internet connection. Only 40%, 38% of the world has active internet. So there's, there's all kinds of people that we're yeah. leaving behind and we can't forget to address that in this conversation. But the hope is that w the kinds of programs that we build are more scalable into those those areas, those economic, social economic circles, than, certainly than, the Ivy Towers are. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm, I'm interested in jumping into that question for a bit, to think about, is it, is it, is it education that it makes the most sense to care about, or is it other things um, to address the people who, who don't have internet, who, who don't have food, who don't have shelter? I'll make one water. quick argument for those who've spent any time in schools what, that might be called low-performing schools. If you want to raise test scores, give everyone lunch. Mm -hmm. If you want to taste test scores, make sure everyone gets breakfast. Yeah. So what role <laughs> does school have to play in order to provide lunch and breakfast? What role does the community have to provide to play lunch and breakfast? And I would make the argument it is a societal and a community construct because if we don't provide lunch and breakfast, 
We're gonna, the, the cost downstream is going to be even more. It's more beneficial to society to have people learn. And I think it's, it's interesting to think about all the different all the different societal functions that we consign to school, like nutrition, like you know being a safe place, like um, you know being you know pr 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 equalizing access to opportunity, and maybe there are, maybe there are other social programs that could serve those same functions yeah. that we yeah. could build I, that I, just I might not be school. Right. Yeah, I, I think that one of the one of the reasons that higher education has kind of turned into this kind of program that it has where there's not direct alignment to job opportunities and a lot of graduates are kind of ending up hosed uh, is that we've equated um, we've, we've, we've equated uh, equal access to opportunity with you must go to school right and uh, I'm really interested in innovation around that that concept right uh, because trying to get force everybody to go into one building to access all things that are important to them age, Five to twenty-two. It's just like factory. not. Yeah. It's just like not not going to work. It's not. Um, it's not cost effective. And so, um, I, I think we should question that. Right. That being said, I do think that there's um, the last mile problem is definitely something that only the government can provide, and society has to decide that it's important to provide that last mile problem. And what I mean by that is like it's it's always more expensive to make sure that everyone has equal access. Like the market's only gonna fulfill 60, 70%. We have to decide as a society, it's really important to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to get the kind of information and the types of experiences that everyone deserves. That's, that's so. the part that I was talking about, uh, about us deciding that we have to proactively go into those yes. spaces or create things that are the most likely adoptable in those spaces. Right. Sure. And again, I don't think ivory towers in Massachusetts are the answer. Right. It's probably something that has to do with scal scalable technology, yeah. community, yeah. Uh, all yeah. those things. But I think that's <laughs> the, <laughs> I mean, the, the other point. I don't think equity and access and excellence need to be mutually exclusive. Right. I think they need to be together. And in defense of a place like the College of, I was a CIO of the College of Education for the University of Washington for six years. One of the things that they did that I have a lot of respect for is, you know, they would place teachers into schools to learn how to become teachers, right? But then they began placing those teachers into community-based organizations as part of their internship to understand that the role that these community-based organizations play in community, and when you're in the classroom, it's just not you and shut the door. There's a community here, and you're not the only one who can solve. Did Are we getting a good lunch? We need to think in, and I think, more systematic processes. And I think whether it's the factorization, the overfactoring of education, or the siloing of education, we've lost sight that we're being asked to answer questions that we can't answer by our Ourselves. We need to figure out how to work together. Yeah. Our program needs to partner with you. Sure. All right. So let's figure it, figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Can I can I add two things yeah. to that? So one thing is when <laughs> when again we think about the structure and the the conceptual framework and the strategy around Creative Live, there are things in teaching that are wonderful that are not broken. It's the educational system that's broken. It's not it's not learning. Yep. So the parts that are great is like right now there are a couple of people um, who are like verbalizing. And you know, waving our hands in the air, diagramming or whatever. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then there's somebody on the other end who is listening. So there's this teacher to student communication, but there's also the student to teacher communication, right? Those guys uh, and gals out there on the internet are be able to ask us questions. You folks here can ask us questions. Both those are mimicking the traditional education system. Yeah. And then there's the student to student part, right. which right now are fulfilled with our chat room. And we're working on that product. It's going to continue to get better. But you've got you know, 500 to 1,000 people in there having their own little side education that's hopefully benefiting what it is that we're doing. So I think when you're talking about where it's coming from all different places in the community as well, these ideas, I want to continue to fulfill that here at Creative Web. That's an important thing. So we've got about five minutes left. Kay. So I think we should take one or two more questions and then wrap up. Is there anything here in the audience? Any of you guys? To ask you got something, Jordan? I don't have a question. But <coughs> I, don't have uh, a question. I, I actually just had a thought. I mean, we've we've been talking about education and the educational system, um, but we've been talking about learning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, no. no. I, actually, I, I want to talk about you know the the demand part of it. The businesses that are looking for these people with college degrees. You know, they're the ones that are that are you know setting this demand for this for all these people going through. You know, how do you change that part of it? Or you guys haven't, I mean, obviously you guys have taken some steps here, but sure. you know, with the greater, you know, business community, how do you, you know, how do you change that line of thinking? I don't know if 
I guess some of the some of the most well respected people that I know in the business sector hacked their own education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they actually were able to position it through the intelligence that they derived through hacking their own education. Right. They positioned it in a way that it was a massive upside. Mm -hmm. I know people that got into college without taking the GRE. That's a f like, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Like, that is. It's like it says in the law that you have to right. do these things. But I went to Canada. Yeah, he went to Canada. <laughs> but. Like that, to me, there is this thing that uh, it's sort of above and beyond. If you can find a way to to succeed without the traditional sort of trajectory, mm -hmm. I think businesses go, "Wow, that's really." It's a, now you have to. There's a narrative around that. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to tell the story about how right. and why you did that, and that's not for everybody. And I, and I don't think that any of these things. And I'm, I don't want to be sort of over overly prescriptive. I want to acknowledge that there's a range of options, mm -hmm. but. I'm not quite sure that the business community is as hard fast on this degree thing that we talk about as culturally. Culturally, no, I think it's a it's a consensus. It's like a societal consensus. Right. It, um, you know, certain large companies that have complex HR operations pre-screen for degrees. Right. But if you're just go approaching a small business and right. you can talk directly to the business owner and you come across as somebody that's going to add value to their organization, you're in. And right? most businesses in this country are small businesses. And most businesses are small businesses. Yeah, so, so I don't know if I, again, agree with the assumption. I, I used to coach my son's baseball team until he realized he'd rather have me dad as not coach. And one of the practices, he goes, you know, Pop, you know how you, you talk about we all need to be on the same page? I said, yeah, you're getting it. He says, there's no such thing as the same page. It's about the links. There's no front door to validate to get that job. There's multiple endpoints into large companies, small companies, NGOs. And again, it's about how do you get into that conversation? How do you demonstrate your work? And how do you make the case that you're adding value? That degree may do that, but increasingly, that's not the thing, right? Told you that? No, he was 12. I grounded him for being. <laughs> I grounded him for being cheeky. Great. You should see what my daughter does with Minecraft. Talk about designing new learning environments. I, the, education. We're all going to be in Minecraft. Yeah. Awesome. So I think I think to, to close off the panel, I want to give you each uh, a minute or two to talk about what are the things that you most want to make absurd about the education system going forward. We're seeing such a time of, of dynamic change uh, with technology impacting education. I'm curious, what, 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 what are the things that you most want to make absurd in 10 years? Uh, creativity is the new literacy. And if we don't understand that, that the, human, that, the, that the fundamental state of being of a human being is to be creative, that uh, we, I want to make that the fact that our culture now is only just starting to understand that to be the most absurd thing. Because creativity, not whether just you know, painting, drawing, photography, but Creativity in business. Seth Godin's, you know, in, in Lynchpin, he calls all his the business people and they're artists because what he's driving at is creativity is this fundamental enabler, enables people to find paths that didn't exist, to create things that weren't there before them, and to feel fulfilled because that's the natural state of a human being. So I aspire to continue to be creative in, in as many ways as I as I can. And if if in the future that idea that creativity used to just mean drawing, painting, um, designing, photographing, yeah. filming. It was a separate. Movie. Yeah, as a, some somehow separate. We've completely missed the boat. So I, that's. I would feel very surprised if we can't turn that in the next five years. Awesome. Uh, I th I think that what needs to become absurd and will become absurd is uh, our relationship with time and our relationship uh, with uh, to work in education or in in schooling in specific. Uh, whereas, you know, with, with this ubiquitous access to information and the ability to kind of have self-paced learning, it makes the idea of having bells going off all day long and all the distractions of people shuffling around, it just makes it totally absurd. And the, why, the way that things are carved into semesters and summers and four-year degree programs just don't make any sense in a world where you're going to constantly need to upgrade your skill sets and you're going to constantly need to uh, to challenge yourself by learning more. And then the next one is, is the relationship uh, to work, which is in school, the work is something you do to practice the knowledge. Whereas like in life, actually like knowledge is a tool you use to do the work and to do great work, right? And uh, I think that's gonna be flipped on its head. And it's just gonna seem absurd that people did all these worksheets just to practice knowledge when <laughs> what you're actually yeah. trying to do is use knowledge as a tool to do great work. Yeah, huh? the, the shift I see happening, and it will happen sooner than 10 years, I'm thinking by 
four o'clock. The shift from teaching to someone to teaching and learning with someone. Mm -hmm. And that goes across the board, whether that's through a creative live experience, through a general assembly experience, through a playground experience or a school experience. How do we become, again, this idea of stewards of learning and, and each other's learning? So I think that's a big move that we need to see. Now, it's gonna be hard, hard to get there, but that's what's great about this particular example, and I'm not, I'm not pimping for you anything, but you have engagement going on at a multiple levels right? People in the audience, people out there. This is going to live beyond our time even here today, and hopefully that discussion will, will get further. So the big shift is how do we create lear engaging learning that shifts teaching to to teaching with, from transmission to transaction. I got, can I, I got 90 seconds. Yeah. Can I squeeze yeah. in one more? I know I'm watching the <laughs> clock there too with you. The, the idea that learning stops at age 22 when you oh, get yeah, out of college, yeah. to me that is, that so we have true. to blow that up. That's and, and that's true. one of the things that I want Creative Lab to really focus on, is this idea of lifelong learning. Sure. To me that narrative is that, that folks can change careers at 30, 40, 50, 60, that we want to be able to represent learning for a range of people, a range of ages, different career paths, and even if you're learning not to have a career in that thing, learning is beautiful. Learning is, uh, I get, and we have to take not only past 22, but the 9, 10, 12 year olds much more seriously. They are super smart. They need to be part of the design of their own learning. And, and as we talk, talked about earlier today, learning requires active engagement. And I, and I, I'm, I'm very pleased that, that you can be a model with this platform, and I hope that everyone, everyone here and everyone watching at home can be a model in their own right of making learning active and engaging.